Good day. Righto. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Max Gofield. Uh, I am going to be talking to you today about how to use remote um, open access remote sensing data to, to look at fishing activity. Um, so just to start the presentation, I thought I'd give a very brief introduction about who I am. You've probably detected I, uh, I've got a Kiwi accent. I'm from New Zealand. Um, and I've loved the ocean since I was young. So I've really followed this passion through my studies, um, studying marine biology and statistics at Victoria University in Wellington. I worked in fisheries in New Zealand uh, for a couple of years, and then I've moved um, to the UK a couple of years ago. Uh, and I, I still love getting in the ocean in the UK, the photos of me collecting some scallops in the middle of the winter the other day. So I work for an organization called Ocean Mind. We're a not-for-profit um, established in 2018. Uh, we're based in Oxfordshire. We specialize in using remote sensing data to support fisheries monitoring, control, and surveillance. Uh, so the map I've provided, we, we partner with governments, non-government organizations, and industry. And the organization's sort of primary focus is addressing the issue of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing activity. And the, the image at the bottom is, is a global view of all of the vessels in the world that transmit on AIS data. And the take home message I wanted to convey is there's, there's literally hundreds of thousands of vessels and this is a global issue that we're facing. Uh, but that, that's enough about me and Ocean Mind. Uh, the purpose of today's tutorial was to talk about uh, open access remote sensing data. And so the two data sets I'm gonna talk about are Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. I'm going to introduce these, then talk about where you can get them um, in terms of access, and then uh, some of the tools that you can use to analyze them. And then the, the sort of the final part of the talk is applying these data sets for um, vessel detection at sea and looking for fishing activity. So the first data set is Sentinel-1. And so Sentinel-1 is part of the European Space Agency's Copernicus program. Um, the sensor itself is actually two polar orbiting satellites. Uh, they collect a data set called synthetic aperture radar. Um, and this data set is, is what's called an active sensor. So the satellites transmit um, an electron beam and the, the satellites then measure the backscatter from that electron beam. And that creates a radar profile. So you're looking at black and white images. The satellites themselves have four different imaging modes, um, but the majority of the data is collected in uh, the IW mode. I'm not going to say it. In, I'll, I'll try. Inferferometric wide swath mode. Um, and, and so we'll focus on that um, through the tutorial today. But the, the key take home message is that this mode has a resolution of five by 20 meters. And the sensors themselves uh, operate both day and night. And so that contrasts with Sentinel-2, which I'll touch on now. Uh, so Sentinel-2, uh, probably unsurprisingly, is also from the European Space Agency's Copernicus program. Um, again, it's a two-satellite constellation. Uh, the satellites in this case are actually directly parallel, um, sorry, opposite each other on, on uh, relative to the, to the Earth. And the sensor in, on the Sentinel-2 satellites is a multi-spectral instrument. Uh, so it's collecting data over the, uh, the bands of light. Uh, for a marine remote sensing application, like we're talking about today, we utilize the, the visible bands. So those are blue, green, and red. Um, and you can think about Sentinel-2 like a, a low resolution photo from space. So these bands that we look at uh, have a 10 by 10 spatial resolution. And um, not surprisingly, uh, given photo from space, it only captures data during the day. So uh, there's no data collection at night. So those are the sensors. The next thing I wanted to, to touch on is where they collect data. So both of the sensors collect data across all of the world's continental land surfaces, um, as well as any island that's greater than 100 kilometers in land area. And most importantly for our marine remote sensing application, uh, they collect data over coastal waters, uh, which are up to 20 kilometers from shore. Uh, so the, the image on the slide is uh, the revisit rate for the Sentinel-1 sensor. And you can see that data is collected at the equator um, every three days. And then as you move to higher latitudes, the, the frequency is um, greater. And that's because the, the satellite orbits the poles. So as you approach the poles, the frequency increases. Uh, and 
showing the same sort of information for Sentinel-2, um, but slightly different, remembering that the sensor only collects data um, during the day. So that means only half the time data can be collected. And so the revisit rate for the vast majority of the world is every five days. So what I wanted to cover um, is what, what are the good features and bad features of these two sensors for marine, uh, marine remote sensing applications? So looking for boats. Um, so I'll start with Sentinel-1. Uh, the, the main positive is that it's completely weather independent. It operates all the time. Uh, so it, because it's firing a, an, an electron beam and measuring the backscatter, things like clouds don't have with the, the sensibility to collect data. Um, in terms of negatives, uh, the, the composition of the target, um, in this case we're looking for vessels, really matters. So the the um, reflectance is much greater of, of more dense objects. So if we apply that knowledge to vessels, um, wooden vessels are not detected very well compared to, to metal vessels. And obviously there's a range of materials that vessels can be um, composed of, but uh, the, the harder the material, the more readily they're detected by the sensor. And so, so smaller non-metal vessels could be missed by the sensor. Um, so I'm going to move to Sentinel-2. Um, so in complete contrast, uh, if you think about our analogy of uh, a photograph from space, uh, the composition of a vessel doesn't matter at all for Sentinel-2. Um, it could be made from paper, it could be made from steel. You still see it with a um, with the Sentinel-2 sensor. Uh, it has another couple of key advantages, um, which really come down to, to the um, weather conditions. So the Sentinel-2 sensor can detect really small vessels in good conditions. And I'll, I think I'll use a little bit of an analogy to sort of describe what I mean here. So if you imagine a really flat, calm ocean, um, you see most people that experience there's just not a wave, not a ripple. If you drop an object into that ocean, um, it'll obviously make a splash, but there'll be a ripple cascading away from that object um, disproportionately larger than the impact of the object itself. And so we can use that effect to our advantage uh, when we're looking for vessels, because we can see the disturbance that they make in the water. And um, in some situations, you can see the disturbance, even though you can't see the vessel because it's so small. Um, and sort of following on from that, uh, it also enables um, you to infer vessel activity, because you realize of the disturbance in the water, the amount of water that's moving, uh, you can infer um, potentially the speed of the vessel, and then, then think about what type of activities that speed would enable the vessel to do. And so it's sort of going beyond detecting a vessel and, and starting to think about its activities. And in some, um, some really good examples, um, you can also even see vessels actively fishing. And I'll, I'll show a couple of examples of that later in the tutorial. So, so it's going beyond just detection and actually thinking about what's going on. Now, uh, the the key disadvantage of Sentinel-2, um, and some people will probably be familiar with this, is that it is very weather dependent. Uh, so there's sort of two strings to that bow. Uh, it cannot see through cloud. Uh, so cloud just completely makes data useless um, because the sensor obviously can't, can't see through it. So you're just looking at photos of clouds, uh, if we're thinking of our analogy. Uh, and also uh, in a marine uh, application, uh, the conditions of the water make a big difference on the ability to detect vessels. So there's there's sort of two elements to this, which is if you've got a really wavy, um, disrupted ocean, then uh, I, I alluded to the fact that you can use the disturbance the vessel makes to detect the vessel. But if the ocean's already disturbed, then you completely lose that advantage. Um, and then following on from that, uh, I think most people will be familiar with um, the term white cap or the, the peaks of waves. You can see waves in the background of my um, slide. And, and so those waves uh, create white, white patches in your, your image and make it a lot harder to detect vessels. So you're seeing a lot of um, more different colors. And if you think about Sentinel-2, and we'll, we'll touch on this later in the tutorial, you're looking for, for different colors in amongst a blue ocean. But if the ocean's no longer blue, it's blue and white, uh, then detecting um, those different things it becomes a lot more difficult. All right, so now I've introduced the sensors, I want to quickly touch on uh, where to get the data. Now, there is quite a number of options. This data is open access. Um, there's a number of uh, platforms that let you access the data. Usually you require a log on, but it's 
it's free to act, uh, free to register and free to access. And uh, my my pick of the pick of the bunch is the Copernicus Open Access Hub. I think it's just the easiest to use and quickest to obtain data. But there's a number of other options like the Sentinel Data Access Service, um, Alaskan Satellite Faculty, um, and also Sentinel Hub, which lets you uh, view optical data without downloading it, which can be advantageous. Um, in terms of the platforms, and they all sort of have this functionality in the advanced search criteria, there's a couple of key things that you can do to sort of refine um, the data sets that you, you um, find in a search result. Uh, so the key ones for Sentinel-1, uh, for, for our application, we use the GRD product type, so you can apply a filter to just, just get that with the results. Uh, and the for Sentinel-2, there's, uh, most of the platforms have a cloud cover filter. And so you can you can set a tolerance for how much cloud that um, you want to put up with in your data. And, and so you can get rid of the images that are sort of high percentages of cloud cover because they're not going to be um, providing you any useful information. Um, just following on, I just wanted to show sort of what the data looks like in the platforms, um, and, well, in, in this case, in the Copernicus platform. Um, so the platform allows you to define a search criteria by like an arbitrary polygon, or, or you can even import shapefiles. Um, the data sets look a bit different, so you can see the size of each of them. So green represents Sentinel-2 data and red Sentinel-1. So that, yeah, the size of the swaths are different, so Sentinel-1 is quite a bit larger. Uh, the, the key take home messages I wanted to provide from this slide is that each swath um, gets collected in repetition. And so if you've got an area of interest, you can you can identify the, the unique ID, which is sort of like these um, this four digit suffix uh, for your area of interest and quickly hone on, on data that's going to be interesting to you and, and just ignore other data. Uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on was the size of the files. So both of these data sets are quite large. So Sentinel-1 um, data is typically one to two gigabytes. You can see the range sort of through these these uh, these points here. And Sentinel, sorry, Sentinel-1, one, one to two gigabytes. Sentinel-2 is sort of 600 megs to a gigabyte. So again, quite large file sizes. Um, so following on from that, I just wanted to touch on analysis platforms. Now, there is a lot of online documentation, tutorials, examples uh, available, and that's created by people who have more experience than me. So I'm not going to go through how to how to import and look at data in these platforms because there's so much existing documentation. I thought it wasn't a good use of the time in the tutorial, um, but I just wanted to touch on two of the platforms that I would recommend. Uh, so the first is Snap, which is a bespoke bit of software for analyzing Sentinel data. So it's really designed for this purpose. Um, again, lots of documentation available, and all of this is linked um, in the web page around this tutorial. Uh, I wanted to touch on two useful features that I, I've found are really helpful, which is the ability um, when analyzing Sentinel-2 data to uh, manipulate colors. So you can change the range of um, the colors that are getting displayed in the platform. And I found that useful to make uh, basically vessels stand out in amongst a blue ocean. If you, if you change those color settings. Um, and also for Sentinel-1 data, there's the Ocean Analysis Toolkit, and that has some really useful functionalities. Um, there's a processing algorithm that will um, detect the high points of reflectance. Uh, so basically detect vessels automatically for, for you. And the code behind that is also open source. So um, you can access that and adapt it. And that's something that, that Ocean Mine's done to increase automation when processing Sentinel-1 data. Um, so that's all, all open open access and available. Uh, the, the second platform I wanted to um, touch on, uh, and it, it's really platform agnostic for GIS platforms, but I, I'm calling, uh, pointing to QGIS because we're, we've got an open access theme with today's tutorial. And this is actually what Ocean Mine uses in our day-to-day -day work. Um, the, the key useful features for GIS platforms is to be able to overlay many complementary layers, many different remote sensing data sets, um, and, and that helps you, um, helps you paint a more complete picture. So the example I've got here is uh, Sentinel-1. I'm um, oh, sorry, I, I didn't explain this before, but uh, when I showed the, the data example, it's of Wellington, New Zealand, and I'm going to follow that example through. Um, and the reason I chose that area is because I know it really well, so I can. It helps me interpret the uh, 
the vessel detections in the in the area. And so within this example, you can see that I've added a layer for a marine, a marine reserve. And so adding information like this really helps with the interpretation of detections. Right. So I'm going to move on to the to the third section of the, the tutorial today, which is vessel detection. And before we go and actually look at raw data sets and look at how to, to, to find vessels uh, with it, each of the two, two data sets, I want to touch on uh, the kind of information that we collect when we detect a vessel. Uh, so in the example, I've just zeroed in on this red triangle, which is represented by a, a detection. And if I, if I pull it up, uh, you can see uh, it's an example from Sentinel-2. It's uh, quite a large vessel um, transiting. Um, but the, the point I wanted to make is the, the, the information we collect. And so the first thing, the most obvious, is the location, so latitude, longitude. Um, but we also apply a confidence with our detection. So how confident are we that this detection represents a vessel? Uh, and we, we apply three categories to that. So high, highly confident. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the second being low. So we think it's a vessel, but we're not 100% confident. And so we're reflecting our uncertainty with a, with a low confidence. And the third is likely false detection. And, and this is when we, we think uh, we can see something there, but we don't think it's a vessel. And the third point I wanted to make, and I'll talk about it again at the end of the tutorial, is how do we interpret the, the sorry, how do we interpret the detection? So, um, in this case, we can see it's a large, uh, large vessel, probably of the size of a freight vessel or a merchant vessel, um, and and so we've got some insight into the type of vessel, um, and then we can we can take that. Um, and apply it to our knowledge of the, the local rules and regulations in that area. So is that vessel um, permitted to do what we're observing it doing in, in that area? And, and providing that the combination of, you know, the type of vessel, its location and the rules and regulations allows you to understand the risk and uh, what's going on with that detection. And you can pass that to your, to your end user. Right, so uh, again, following the natural order, we're going to look at Sentinel-1 data first. So this is a, a Sentinel-1 image um, from Wellington Harbour. So following through the example from Wellington, uh, it's from the 27th of August. Um, and I think there's a few things that stand out in this. Um, the first is that land really dominates the image. Uh, you're getting a really, really bright reflectance from the land. and and so that makes it quite hard to, um, sorry, it dominates the image and, and means you're, there's a little bit of uncertainty around where the land ends. Um, and so we can, we, can, we can deal with that problem by masking out the land, so creating a land mask. Um, because if, if, if I take the example of up here, up on this peninsula, you can see, you see there's a peninsula jutting into the ocean, but where does the peninsula end and where are we actually going to be looking because we want we're, we're looking for vessels in amongst a dark ocean and so we're looking for the bright spots but we want to know basically where the ocean starts and so what we do is we create uh, what's called a land mask now there's there's a number of ways of of doing this um, you could uh, get a, a polygon for the for the land mass uh, in your area of interest and apply a buffer but i actually generally find just drawing around the outline of the land is not a bad way of doing it. And I'd also really encourage people if they're going to um, do, you know, repeat use of Sentinel-1 data, especially in the same uh, area of interest, to spend the time creating a good quality land mask, because you will detect the same rock over and over again. And, and knowing it's a rock can save you a lot of time. Uh, I, I can speak from personal experience. And so, so in this area, the key thing to get out is like these are washed reefs in this area, if you can see my mouse. Um, and, and just getting a clear distinction between land and sea. Now, if we apply that to our um, Sentinel-1 data set, it becomes a lot easier to interpret because, because we know where the lay of the land is. Um, so, so now we, we know where the land is, where are the vessels? So what we're looking for is an elevated backscatter. Um, so what I mean by that is a white spot in the black ocean or gray, arguably. Um, and 
The other thing that you often see associated with vessels is streaks. Um, and what I mean by that is sort of a linear line coming away from a high point, and that's the, the radar signal sort of bouncing off a solid object. Now, I'm going to look at the high confidence detections first. So in this image, I only see uh, one high confidence detection, which is uh, this one here. And you can see that there's quite a strong reflectance um, of a couple of pixels in size. And so this is indicative of potentially a vessel with a, with a uh, metal construction. We talked about earlier, the construction material makes quite a big difference. Um, and in this area, um, applying my local knowledge, uh, this is likely to be representative of a, a small commercial vessel. Um, obviously, with radar data, we don't have any insight to what the vessel is doing, but but that you know we can still apply um, based on the, the size of the vessel. And it's worth pointing out that most analysis tools have have a measurement tool, so you can measure uh, how long uh, your your uh, vessel detection is. Then you can apply um, knowledge uh, your, or apply your local knowledge to what sort of vessel would meet that size class. Um, if we now look at low confidence detections, now there's quite a lot of those in this image for me. Um, and all of these detections, you can see they're distinct from the surrounding ocean. The, the, the radar sensor is picking up something, but the reflectance isn't, isn't strong. So to me, that indicates it's likely to be um, either a small object or a non-metal object. And as a consequence, I'm not highly confident it's a vessel. It's not showing a profile aligned with a vessel, um, but, it, but it is showing something. And applying my knowledge to the area, uh, there's a lot of vessels likely to be operating in this area. Um, this is the entrance to a harbour to a major city. So I chose it because it's a good example um, of, of an area where I'm going to see a lot of vessels. So it, it's a good example for a tutorial. Um, and if I was going to hazard a guess at what type of vessels these are, I would say they're likely to be uh, recreational vessels in the sub 20 metre size class. And uh, given their location, they're likely to be transiting in and out of the harbour. So, Acknowledging that that's just one, one um, snapshot of an image, I wanted to provide some alternate examples of profiles of vessels in Sentinel-1 data because it, it gives you an more of a idea of the range of things that you might observe. So if I move left to right and give a brief explanation of each of these detections. Uh, so the first is um, what you would associate with a large merchant vessel. Uh, so you, so these sorry these vessels are generally steel in composition um, and they're generally quite large, you know, hundreds of meters in size. And it's a good example because you can see um, the streaks that I was talking about. So uh, left to right and up and down, um, and that's the radar sensor sort of bouncing off um, the vessel in a, in a, on a sort of different angle, and then the sensor picks that up. Uh, the, the second image is uh, as, as a much smaller vessel, but again, you can see that really strong pronounced radar profile, so I would again suggest that that's likely to be of a, a metal composition. Um, it's, it's of a size class, it's a few pixels in size, so sort of 40 to 60 meters in size. Um, and depending where that detection was, that's the kind of thing that we uh, kind of size and profile would associate with a, um, a commercial fishing vessel. Uh, the third example I think is a good one because you can see the, the vessel itself or it has a profile that's a, um, a couple of pixels in size, but there's a range of um, there's a range of reflectance in there. So one of the pixels is really bright and then the others are, are less bright. And that could be indicative of a vessel that's potentially not a, of a metal construction, but features on it are. So if you think about a, um, a, a moderately sized commercial vessel, features like the bridge of the vessel um, and the, the cranes and hauling gear of the vessel are potentially metal and have higher reflectance than the other parts of the vessel. And so, so there's a good example of seeing a, a profile with sort of variable um, reflectance from, from the sensor. And then the final example is just an example of a, of a really, really small vessel um, that you've seen from the sensor. So there's potentially only one pixel in size. Um, and so this would be indicative of, yeah, a sub 20 meter vessel. So you, you're seeing something, it's really, really small. Right, so those, those are my examples of um, vessels with Sentinel-1. So I'm going to move to Sentinel-2. And 
again, following the example of Wellington Harbour. So exactly the same area of interest. Um, this, this image is from the 21st of August. Um, one comment on it is it's quite a clear, calm day. So in the, earlier in the tutorial, I talked about that really helping our ability to detect vessels with Sentinel-2 data. And I think the most striking thing that I hope everyone sees is that the vessels are quite apparent in Sentinel-2 because of their weight. So you can see a number of vessels. Um, and in terms of what we're looking for for vessels is uh, the wake, the disturbance in the ocean, um, and also a different colored pixel, which would be the vessel itself. So it looks different from the blue ocean. And as you can see in this image, there's, there's lots and lots of vessels that are clearly shown by their wakes. Um, so if I look at the high confidence detections first, um, I hope, hopefully everyone picked up on all of these. Um, and and if we follow on from from what we talked about earlier, uh, because we can see the wake, we can have some inference on what the vessel is doing. So these vessels with really long are likely to be transiting or traveling at quite a high speed. Um, in contrast to this one here and this one here, which have quite a lot smaller wakes or traveling at quite a lot slower speed. And, and those two vessels are at a speed that could enable fishing activity. So that'd be much more of interest and I'd be more worried about um, the relevant marine boundaries in the area. So in terms of interpreting what the vessels are up to, um, these four to me are likely to be transiting back in after time on the water. Um, the same as this vessel here. I know there's a boat ramp in, in this bay here. Uh, this, this vessel is heading along the coastline, but again at a speed um, that's likely to be associated with transiting. And then these two are both in the areas that could be associated with fishing. Um, so this area is frequented by uh, vessels that operate lobster pots and dive. The vessel is quite small, um, sort of one to two pixels, so 10 to 20 metres in size. So that could be associated with a, a small commercial or a recreational vessel. Um, there's no relevant fishing regulations in this area. And then this vessel is quite large, um, 20 to 30 metres in size. Um, so the size class of a small commercial vessel, um, potentially uh, a trawler, um, given my knowledge of Wellington. And what's interesting is this actually quite close to um, the start of a marine reserve. Um, it sort of goes straight off this point. There's a marine reserve that comes one kilometre offshore. And so so the activities of this vessel would be very interesting. Obviously, it's not in the reserve, but it's heading in that direction and its speeds potentially enabling it to, to fish. So, so you can see how I'm sort of applying local knowledge to help with the interpretation. Now, if we look at low confidence detections, um, I'll, I'll toggle that back off. I see one here. So there's, there's one or two different colored pixels. Um, so I'm not 100% sure that's a vessel, but to me it's, indicative um, of a vessel because of that, that color differentiation. But it's a vessel that's not moving, so it's likely to be at anchor. Um, given its size, it, um, my interpretation is probably a, a recreational fishing vessel at anchor. Um, and then also in, the, in this slide, there's a, there's a clear likely false detection, uh, which is a plane. Uh, and, and so uh, it's a good example of a false detection. I, and I always find it amusing when using optical data and, and seeing planes, because it's a unique perspective looking down on planes. Um, so like Sentinel-1, um, with Sentinel-2 data, I just wanted to provide some alternate examples of detections, because um, obviously the, the one, one um, piece of imagery we've looked at is, is not representative of, of the wider world. Um, so, Again, provide an example of what a, a large commercial um, ship looks like. Uh, so we looked at this image uh, earlier in the tutorial and you can see the vessels sort of um, quite a number of pixels long. So in that sort of 100 meter plus size class and that um, is very likely to be a large commercial vessel um, like, a, like a ship, uh, like a container ship. Um, and then if we look at the second and third detections, these are really cool uh, because we're going beyond detection going on into beyond interpretation, and we can actually see uh, very likely active fishing activity. Uh, so the first is qu quite a large vessel, um, and you can see it, it's per seine net. So this, this looks like it's actively per seining. So you can see the buoys atop the net, and the nets, um, the purse is slowly being closed, and it's not quite closed. Um, if we move to the third image, 
these two vessels are um, of a similar size. Um, they're traveling in parallel, a fixed distance apart at a slow speed. And so this would be indicative of pair trawling. So they, um, the fishing method, they have a, a trawl net between the two vessels. Um, and we can look and measure the distance between the vessels um, and apply that to uh, how far apart you, we know pair trawlers to operate to sort of provide some more positive uh, verification on that. Uh, now, the fourth and final example is, again, the example of the really, really small vessel. And I, I touched on this earlier in the tutorial, uh, where this vessel is actually so small, we maybe there's one pixel that's of a different color to the ocean, but it's sort of in that sub 10 meter size class. But because of the wake of its movement, we can be quite confident it's there. We can see the disturbance it's making in the ocean. And so that really shows the power of Seasonal 2 for detecting vessels in calm conditions. OK, and so to conclude, I just wanted to, to go back to the, um, the point on how to interpret detections. And so I hope with um, taking this example of Wellington, so an area I, I lived in for a number of years and I know really well, you can see the value of understanding the types of vessels that operate within your area of interest. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be your local knowledge. You can gain local knowledge from colleagues. Um, but having local knowledge on the types of vessels within each of each size classes. So when you get a detection and you can measure its size and then you can work out the likely vessel type. And then following on from that, you can understand the, the local marine boundaries and regulations that apply to that vessel type, which enables you to understand the risk associated with the detection. Um, and the final point, and I, I, hope, I hope it's been clear with the um, presentation today, is that um, you can use um, different remote sensors to complement each other. So uh, I hope the tutorial of today has showed um, the utilities of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, but how they can also complement each other to provide a more um, complete picture of an area of interest. And there's other sensors that can, you know, can be added to, to provide that complete, complete picture. OK, so, so that's all the content uh, that I have for today. Uh, I've talked for slightly too long, so I apologize for that. Um, but I'd like to take, take the opportunity to acknowledge the Wild Labs team for coordinating this, the series. I, I think it's a really good initiative. I'm um, really, really happy to contribute. Um, and along that line, it's, it's also worth acknowledging Flora and Fauna International. They encouraged Ocean Mind to participate in the series, and they're a partner organization. And, and so are um, Microsoft. Uh, our systems are run with Microsoft and Microsoft AI. So there's some nice synergies between um, the Tech Tutor series and, and Ocean Mind. So really happy to contribute and, and look forward to, to answering your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, so much, Max. That was so interesting. Um, uh, so, uh, guys, if you've got questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat or drop them into directly uh, the, the data wrapper notes. Um, I'm going to speak for Catherine first up because she needed to hop away. Um, she was asking, is the software available across different operating sy systems? I, I think this came up quite early in your talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. Um, I'm I'm not 100% sure because I I do work in the Windows um, OS pretty much exclusively, but my uh, certainly QGIS is, um, and I'm pretty sure Snap is as well. So yeah, should be available in, in well in, in um, Mac and Microsoft at least. Um, Catherine, I will say that it might work if you run into issues jumping into the thread on Wild Labs. Um, uh, you'll be able to, we'll be able, we'll keep track of it and um, be able to provide support if you run into troubles trying to use what um, Max has, has demonstrated today. Um, Rob, I think you're up next. Hi, Max. Uh, great talk. Very interesting. This is something I know nothing about. Um, so this has been really interesting. Um, when you were talking about um, going through the data, it seemed to me like a lot of what you were doing is kind of a manual process of first spotting, you know, the wakes, etc. Is is that is that essentially correct, or are you? I'm, you mentioned right at the end there that you're doing some AI stuff with Microsoft. I, I'm just interested in that process and um, 
how you tell the difference between different vessels. Cool. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I, I um, you might have seen I pushed the the limits of my speaking slot, so it was something I wanted to touch on because there's in the Tech Tutor series there's there's a theme about using AI and machine learning. Now, uh, the answer is different uh, for the, each of the data sets. So for, for Sentinel-1, there is certainly automation um, available. So I touched on the Snap Toolbox um, having features to, to do auto automatic detections. Um, and so, so that's available in open source. And there's certainly refinements to the, to this, the open source data that could be done, but it, it, it is already existing and, and accessible to the, to the wider community. For Sentinel-2, it's fundamentally hard. Um, as far as I know, there's no scalable uh, way to automate, automatically detect um, vessels with optical data. And the reason for that is there's so much variation in colors um, in optical data images. So I provided that example of the, you know, a really clear day, it's quite easy to spot the vessels and detect them. And the same uh, logic applies for machine learning and, and finding vessels with, with machine learning algorithms. So people can do it in really good conditions, but they can't do it when it's rough or the sea state's not good or these clouds. Um, that's that's my awareness. And I think that 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 gap will be closed, um, but I don't think it's been closed yet. And, and so because there's so much variation in the colors within an individual image, it makes it really hard to apply ML to. Um, because each the the signature you see from a vessel uh, changes in each each different image, so, so that because the baseline shifts so much, there's no um, standard application of ML possible. Um, but I know there's a lot of research in the space trying to bridge the gap, and so I, I might not be right up with the state of play, but that, that's my understanding of it now. Um, and I, your last point that yeah, we use Microsoft AI um, for vessel track analysis. And so it's it's not this type of remote sensing analysis, but it's, it's other parts of our work that's sort of outside of the scope of this talk. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That that's great. It, it I suspected you know that it would be something that would be progressing. Just one final follow up. I saw in one of your slides that there was a mention of a Sentinel three. Is that a different platform or? Yeah, yeah. So there's actually six Sentinel missions, um, and I, sorry, I, I don't know what the, all the data they collect. Uh, it varies. They, they they look at stuff like global chains, emissions. Um, what else is there? Yeah, there's a number of different Sentinel platforms. They collect lots of different data, um, and they have a range of purposes. But I, sorry, I can't tell tell them all to you because we we basically use one and two um, for the for our um, work. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Great talk. Um, I believe uh, Liam is next. Do you want to jump in, Liam? Hi uh, there. Sorry, okay. my cameras are, are going all weird. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering what role, uh, I guess, first of all, like what if you see a ship that is you suspect is doing illegal uh, fishing activity, how do you then identify the specific ship? Uh, so like, not just there was a random ship, how do you identify exactly which ship it was at that time? And uh, what role does Ocean Mind have in moving forward with like legal action afterwards or uh, fines or anything like that? Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so what we do in our typical analysis with Ocean Mind is, uh, so we have a, we also use vessel tracking data um, to complement our remote sensing data sets. Um, so there, there's two sorts, two sources of that. So um, there's a signal called AIS, uh, which is basically the signal that ships um, send to each other. It's an anti-collision system. So they, it, all it says is. Um, this is who I am, this is where I'm going, um, and the idea of it is every ship transmits that and they don't crash into each other because they can um, receive each other's transmissions. Um, now that's a signal transmitted over the radio frequency, uh, but satellite, because it, so it goes over the horizon um, at ocean, uh, in the ocean, but it also goes straight up, and so so it's picked up by satellites and it's, um, it's 
so we we have a, a global access of AIS, and so we use that to know the basically the known ships in the area. And so there's a distinction between known ships and unknown. So unknown vessels uh, we call uh, is commonly called dark targets. So in, in that situation, you you have no idea of the vessel's identity, um, or the the uh, the other situation where you've got a, a, some sort of vessel tracking system and you have an idea of the identity, and and so it could could be either. Um, in terms of how we uh, interact with that, it really depends on um, the partner and the project. So we do a lot of work, which is like historical risk assessment. So looking at um, the past multiple years or a period of time for an area and identifying um, high risk and informing sort of future um, decisions on how to how to run enforcement um, and then an, another line of work is you know direct support to uh, patrol uh, or enforcement assets on the water so we're providing uh, intelligence about the position of um, vessels to to the enforcement assets and, and so it really depends on the project but sometimes it would be um, just recording the potential non-compliance for follow-up um, if, it, if it's happened in the past, or it could be passing information direct to a patrol um, asset to go and take enforcement action and try and find the vessel that's been detected to be potentially non-compliant. Or again, if they know what the vessel is because we've got it on vessel tracking, and then, then it becomes a lot easier to follow up. So you can reach out to the um, to the state who's responsible for that vessel, um, depending on where it is. Does, does that address your question? Is, any follow-ups? Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. It was really helpful. <coughs> oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, Goha, I think you're next. Do you want to jump oh, in? Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Max. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, so apart from the uh, XY coordinate data on the vessels that you are, um, that the database collects, do you guys have to collect any additional information about the vessels, such as the flag, the length of time they've spent there, the type of vessel it is, it's it, maybe it's movement of where it potentially landed, its catches and stuff like that. Yep, yeah, so certainly we do. Um, it, again, it depends on um, the project and the application at the time, but a lot of the time, um, if you've got vessel tracking data of some form, then it's a lot easier because you have some form of identity, you know whose um, jurisdiction the vessel's under, and then you can follow the vessel and its movements to um, its port of landing. In terms mm -hmm. of remote sensing, um, when we get detections, we typically cl um, collect yeah, X, Y, um, the, the course, um, so if you're thinking about like radar or Sentinel um, two, you can tell which direction it's going. Um, you can tell its length. Um, is there anything else? Uh, sometimes width. So you you can get um, some information about the vessel, uh, even if you don't know its identity. Uh, but it's obviously the best case scenario is you do know its identity because then you can continue to follow it. You don't just have one snapshot in time, and then you mm -hmm. can you know, do things like follow up with the port authority. Um, with the state who's responsible for the vessel. Um, it becomes a lot easier if you do know its identity. But that being said, obviously, if you are um, if you put on your illegal fishing hat, you, you don't want to be transmitting who you are and where you're going if you're going to do something bad, um, if you think someone's looking. And, and so commonly, the, the bad actors are not um, being transparent and transmitting. D uh, does that address your question? Do you have any follow-ups? Yeah. Can I have a quick follow-up? Uh, yeah, of course. That's okay. um, <clears throat> I know there are a few other kind of sources uh, that provide very similar information to what Ocean Mind does. Uh, the ones that come to my mind are, um, I don't know, Sky Truth and Global Fishing Watch. I was wondering if, if I were to, let's say, download the data from Ocean Mind, would it be, or in what w way will this be complementary to the other databases that I could potentially use? Kind of understand the activities better. Is it complementary yeah. or is it really collecting the same type of information? And if so, what would be the most advantageous? What would be the advantage of using Ocean Mind versus? I don't know, yeah. <laughs> um, Good. <laughs> it's a great it's, question. It's, 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 it's a tough question. Uh, I think the easy one to talk to um, is Global Fishing Watch because I'm quite familiar with it. I, I think um, Sky Truth operate in a similar space to us. I mean, we we don't offer data. 
we um, offer, we basically, inter um, for the, the vast majority of our work is interpreting um, remote sensing data and providing intelligence to partners. Right. Um, and so I think Sky's true, I'm not that familiar with the organization, but they work in a similar space. Global Fishing Watch is more complementary. So their um, role primarily is around increasing transparency on fishing vessels. So they um, have a platform like their interactive map where they uh, provide an oversight um, with aggregated data, so not, not high resolution of where yeah. um, all of the AIS activity based on fishing vessels operates in the world. And, and so that enables um, anyone to go and look at that and, and sort of see where fishing vessels are operating now and in the past. So that, that is very much complementary to the kind of work we do. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, OK, Braden, do you have a mic? You didn't answer. If you do, now is your chance to jump in. Yeah, hi. Uh, he kind of answered my question, but it was just asking if you've compared data to from rough seas to calm seas. Like I work up in the Bering Sea mostly, so I'm not sure how applicable this would be up there. Yeah, um, in the Bering Sea, you have the additional challenge of ice because ice is a real um, game changer in terms of uh, certainly with radar data, you get you hit all the icebergs and they often have profiles of fishing vessels. So the interpretation of data becomes really difficult if you think there's vessels that aren't transmitting in your area. Um, so we do use the data sets. Um, uh, so we one of our partners is the um, UK government. And so uh, the UK, uh, two of the UK overseas territories are in um, the subantarctic. So it would be similar to the Bering Sea. Um, and the advantage of of using the sensors in those areas is because they're polar orbiting, they have really good coverage um, at higher lat latitudes. So there's a lot of data available, um, but yeah, the, the limitation is that they're really, really rough conditions. So you can certainly see vessels, um, but small vessels become really hard to detect. And one thing I didn't touch on is when you're using radar data, um, really, really rough conditions do actually affect that too. Because if you think about waves, you know, oscillating up and down, the, the position of the vessel on the wave um, makes a difference. So if it's on the top, it's a lot easier to see than if it's in the trough, because it could be obscured by another wave, if that makes sense. Um, so I guess in short, the data sets are good um, in those areas still for large vessels. And given the rough nature, the vessels in the area are probably going to be relatively large. Um, but again, better in calmer conditions. Um, so Rian, I think you're, I know Andy's dropping in very helpful uh, links throughout the chat, but uh, Rian, did you want to jump in and ask a question? I'm not sure if he's got a mic. Uh, he's asking for which uh, source country boundary data is used? Oh, where, yeah, where do you get country boundary da data sources? Um, Generally, we use marine regions. Um, it's a it's a freely accessible data set. It's really really pretty good. Although that being said, um, the version nine and version ten there are actually some discrepancies in some areas. But for the vast majority of um, the world, marine regions, um, exclusive economic zones, and country boundaries is uh, like the globally accepted boundaries. So obviously some countries, the, the marine boundaries are still in dispute. And so when the, what they do in that case is they provide the baseline um, following in line with UNCLOS, so the UN Convention of Law of the Seas. Um, so yeah, marine regions is the short answer. Okay, I think uh, Andy's put in a nice link to that. We'll drop those in the notes as well. Um, Ellie, I think you had a question. This is a, this is unusual. Ooh, You're on so, good. Oh, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, yeah, good job. Okay, so um, I think I mentioned already in the chat, uh, we have the Wild Lab Sustainable Fishing Challenges group, and what that group focuses on is kind of um, the long-term perspective on these technologies, where they're heading over the next uh, decade or so, what the solutions coming out will look like eventually, especially um, collaboratively bringing these technologies together. So I was wondering if you have a perspective on where remote sensing is heading and uh, what you would dream of seeing within the next decade for this uh, to be used for? 
Uh, I don't know about dream. I, I haven't I haven't put that much um, thought into it. But I think th the one comment I would make is that there really is a space race in terms of satellites going up. Smaller and smaller satellites are going up more and more, um, and the the cost is really going down. And as a consequence of that, there is a huge uh, the the market for um, remote sensing data in the commercial sense is getting a lot more competitive. A lot more data is heading towards being freely available, which makes it really great for for use like so so at the moment we're talking about sentinel one sentinel two these are quite old missions sort of 10 15 years old um, but there's going to be in, in the not too distant future there'll be much higher resolution data sets um, both optical and um, SAR and, and lots of other different sensors that uh, will be increase the power of being able to detect vessels and be, being used in a marine remote sensing space. So that's really exciting. And there's rumor that a lot of that data is going to be freely available. So that's that's really cool. Um, I, I'm not sure about like sort of dream aspirations. I think what I find most exciting is the, the really high res optical data. I think that's really, really powerful. I think if you want an example of that, um, one of the partners we have is Digital Globe. And so their imagery is most of the imagery in the Google Earth engine. I know I know the next tech tutor talk is going to talk about that engine itself, but it's it's obviously Google Earth has historic data, but it's it's of such a high resolution. You know, your 50 centimeter resolution. We're not too far away from being able to see me standing on the deck of a boat waving from a satellite, which is pretty remarkable. Awesome. Um, I have one follow up question. So if people from the Wild Labs community wanted to get involved in, say, advancing this kind of technology or in, you know, applying this to their own projects in terms of sustainable fishing, what would what are like some steps that you would recommend people take to get involved in that kind of work? Um. Like are there are there any glaring gaps in this technology that maybe people from the wild labs community could could step up and like figure out solutions to or, or something along those lines? Yeah, well, I, I think one thing we've useful, usefully done in some areas um, and using this open access data is you can use it to um, create a really good baseline understanding of what's going on within your area of interest. Um, and, and so then you can monitor change. And you can see if, um, for example, you have a conservation initiative, you're, you could be doing something like increasing a habitat of, of like mangrove, seagrass, not seagrass is a bad example, mangrove, or, or you're implementing a marine reserve or a conservation project. You can, can use open access data to create baselines and then monitor change and see, see what's happening. And so I think that that's a really useful application I've seen of, of the data sets I've, I've talked about today. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, Owen, do you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Max. That was awesome. Um, I was just wondering what the uh, delay with the data being sort of captured to being available is um, just in terms of like active enforcement. And sorry if you mentioned it. Um, just because, you know, obviously, even when you get evidence via satellites of fishes, fisher, uh, fishing boats operating in closed areas, it's still so hard to prove they're actually taking resources from there. So these kind of, um, sort of data products need to be pretty quick to allow, you know, real time enforcement. Or is it more of a case of in the future, understanding maybe hotspots of, you know, illegal activity to target patrol vessels? Um, yeah, so so both to answer your question. Um, so. In terms of the data sets we talked about today, they're typically, it actually depends on the platform you access the data from. Some of them have it quicker than others. Um, so that's why I recommended this, the SciHub one because it, it is the, uh, the less latency. Um, so I think that's, it's, it's almost um, 24 hours. Uh, in terms of Ocean Mine's wider work, if we've got commercial products, so we often have uh, purchased commercial uh, radar data in particular. Um, and that comes to us uh, with about a six hour lag. So it's not live, but it's um, close enough to, to be able to action um, and respond to um, potential non-compliance if you have live assets operating. Um, but then in general, we, we use the data to provide uh, risk assessments of areas. So identifying high risk areas, high risk seasons, because then you can use that information to target your, your future activity and to be more efficient with your um, 
patrol assets because something I haven't touched on is having having enforcement you know actors on the water is very expensive and actually using remote sensing data to make their activities more efficient is is quite a good um, economic driver because because it, it actually is becoming it's it's not that expensive I mean obviously we're not for profit we, we're trying to do a good thing not 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 make money um, so so our services aren't expensive but the, the data itself isn't expensive relative to the cost of running a vessel, so it can really um, make make operations a lot more efficient as well. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. Um, all right, we've hit the hour, um, so I'm going to wrap us up there. Thank you so much, Max. That was such an interesting session, um, a really great way to kick off season two. Um, so, And thank you, everyone, for joining us for, for this episode. Um, next week, we're going to have Hattie, who's going to do a super complimentary talk, um, talking about how to use Google Earth Engine and um, open access data. So come along next week if you're interested in today. I think next week will be of interest as well. We've dropped the link in the chat and you can register now. Um, and yeah, if you want to hang around, we generally we stop recording and we just have a chat with conservation tech people. Um, so it's super friendly if you want to stay. Um, but otherwise, thanks so much, Max, and we'll see you all next week.